Hi and welcome to the Ontario Pesticide Vendor Certification Course. In this video today we're going to be talking about drift of pesticides. So there are many factors to consider when we're talking about drift of pesticides. The method that we're using, um, the equipment that we are applying the pesticide with, the actual pesticide itself or the product, the target that we're going after, and the weather. Uh, so there's all those factors, but it really comes down to the operator. Uh, the operator has to take all those things into consideration what, to safely apply a pesticide. The photograph to the right, you'll see, um, there, at the top, the area that uh, we had herbicide drift here, it says, uh, was a tomato field. And the boxed in area was uh, tomatoes that were transplanted uh, earlier and then at the bottom of the screen there was a herbicide spray took place and there was vapor drift or sorry there was drift during an inversion and it went across into this field and damaged the tomatoes. You can see to the right of that line at the top those tomatoes all look healthy. So the drift took place they continued transplanting and there was no damage after that time. There are two types of spray drift drifts to consider. Spray drift itself is the movement of spray droplets away from the target area and that happens at the time of application. Vapor drift however is the movement of pesticide vapors and it can happen depending on the product two or three days after the application. Today we have numerous uh, nozzles that can create different droplet sizes. We can create droplet sizes very fine, uh, down to um, you know 25 microns, which is almost like a fog. Uh, medium coarse droplets are like a fine drizzle at 150 microns. We have coarse droplet sizes. It's more like a heavy drizzle, 300 microns, so double the size going from medium to coarse. And uh, although my screen hides it at the very bottom, we now have ultra coarse droplet size. Um, and that's 2,000 microns. And it's almost like the droplets you'll see at the start of a thunderstorm, those great big giant drops that hit your windshield um, as you're driving along in a storm. So a huge variety of droplet sizes that we can create depending on the equipment we're using and, of course, the nozzles that we're using. And... We have to consider what droplet size uh, is necessary to uh, satisfy the needs on the label to control the pests that we're going after. So there are times when we do want a very fine droplet size. However, we know uh, that the finer the droplet size, the more drift potential that we have. So the type of nozzle can uh, dramatically change what happens in the same conditions. In the top left picture, we see a sprayer that's sitting stationary and it has regular flat fanned nozzles in the sprayer. The sprayer is turned on and you can see the mist behind the sprayer. The wind is blowing from left to right. And then on the top right picture, you can see the ragged edge of that herbicide damage in the uh, wheat that's in that field. So you can see how the wind carried it. Um, immediately after the top picture was taken, the bottom picture, they went and used uh, air induction nozzles, so the same volume of spray was being put out by the sprayer, but using air induction nozzles at the same time shows you on the bottom right hand picture what a clear cut edge that we end up with by not having all those fines drifting over into where we didn't want them. So type of nozzle dramatically changes what happens when we're spraying. Travel speed. Uh, travel speed, uh, the faster we travel, the more increased likelihood of drift. Um, so behind a sprayer that's traveling at a high rate of speed, you'll have air currents doing strange things to the uh, droplets coming off the sprayer. A great example of that is if you can imagine going up a four-lane highway, and uh, it's a calm day, but you start to pull up probably too close behind a tractor trailer. Sometimes you'll get into an area where it'll actually jostle you around in your car or pickup truck 
because you're getting that turbulent air behind that pickup truck or behind that semi rather. So in those instances, you're seeing that turbulence behind that vehicle. Of course, we're not driving 100 kilometers or more an hour. However, uh, think of how light and small spray droplets are. So the travel speed is enough, can cause enough air current to disrupt the normal flow of those uh, droplets down to the target. Nozzle height. So nozzle to target distance. So in some cases we're shooting at a, a higher target, but the closer that we can run our nozzles to the ground and still, or to our target, and still get our coverage, our proper overlap, the better uh, we are, the less drift there will be. And again, you can see in this uh, series of photos, on the left with the boom being lower, um, there is a little bit of drift, but it greatly increases on the right hand side. So this is just moments apart these pictures were taken. And by the higher nozzle, the more drift. Another consideration is the uh, weather conditions at the time of spraying. If we look at the example on the right, we have a, if we consider that uh, the booms are all the same height, so that's not the difference here, it's the weather uh, and air conditions. On the left, we have high relative humidity and low temperature. So in an example, that would be a day where it's maybe only 12 or 15 degrees uh, Celsius outside, and but the relative humidity is high. Maybe we're 90 to 100 percent relative humidity. That air is already saturated and is not going to absorb uh, moisture in as quickly. So from the time the droplet leaves the nozzle to the time it hits the target, that droplet has remained the same size and weight and therefore does not have as much ability to drift. On the right hand side of this shot we see an example of low relative humidity and high temperature. So let's say for example we have a day that's 30 degrees Celsius and 40 percent relative humidity. So the air is extremely dry and it's hot. From the time that same droplet uh, leaves the nozzle till it hits the target. Due to evaporation, that droplet size is decreasing, so it's getting lighter, and we have more potential for drift because of the low relative humidity and high temperature. Another uh, weather condition that uh, we have learned more about in the last number of years is temperature inversions. So let's start how our air is heated. In the top picture, the normal pattern, as the sun comes up during the day, the sun will heat uh, the ground, the trees, the blacktop, uh, whatever is on the ground, and then that ground and, and buildings and so on radiate the heat up into the air. So the sun does not directly heat the air. The air is heated by the uh, heat given off from the from the earth and the uh, crops and soil and so on. So normally that warm air starts at the bottom and it rises up. So as it gets higher it expands and it cools. And the higher we go the cooler it gets. As a matter of fact as as we climb normally as I'm a pilot as we climb uh, we generally have the temperature lower three degrees per thousand feet of altitude, three degrees Celsius. So that's the normal uh, air layers that you would see. Now what happens during uh, temperature inversion, so late in the day when the sun sets, you now no longer have that sun's energy heating the soil close to the ground and we end up with cooler air because that soil is no longer giving off that heat. Then what happens in and it has to be in calm conditions so there's very little wind, what happens is that warm air above traps the cool air below. So, uh, and then we have cool air above that. So we have that warm uh, inversion layer and it can range anywhere from a few feet up to 20 or 30 feet, but it still traps that cool air. What happens then as we're spraying and there's no wind and it's calm, we can have those fine spray droplets coming off the sprayer remain suspended in the air. So, how do we know that? 
um, or how do we realize that that might be? So it's oftentimes in the evening when the sun's setting and there's less energy. Um, we usually have dead calm conditions. You'll often see uh, fog in low-lying areas or dew or frost starting to become present. The other thing you might see as well, if you're on a gravel road and a vehicle goes up the road, you might see that dust from the road just hanging in the air and not hardly moving. You might come back 15 minutes later and the dust is still hardly moved at all. That's a sign there's an inversion. Another clue is that you might see uh, something being burnt, a brush pile being burnt, and you'll see that smoke rise up in the air and it almost looks like it hits an invisible ceiling and suddenly the smoke starts to move horizontally. That's where the inversion layer is and that smoke is unable to rise. So again, um, those are times when not to spray. Um, so again, be aware of those conditions and the results of those temperature inversions because there's very, very high likelihood of those droplets staying, staying suspended for a long period of time. Once they're suspended, you really don't know where they may go or where they'll end up. Uh, the wind could change direction completely and carry it over to an adjacent crop that would cause crop damage or a non-crop area or water or many other scenarios, uh, none of which are good. So never ever spray when it's dead calm. Um, this next slide still talks about inversion. Again, it's cool air near the ground trapped under a layer warm. But why I'd like to show this is this clock over here on the right. So you can see that uh, uh, in the morning, or sorry, let's start in the evening, uh, inversions can build. So later in the evening, these times aren't always exact, but when the sun starts to go down, you'll see an inversion build. And overnight, it can also have that inversions. And then in the morning, it's going to stay until the sun heats that soil and, and starts to give off that heat. And we see that often. You'll see a foggy morning when you're, when you're going out. That's, if it's foggy, park the sprayer. Don't try it. So inversions can cause a lot of damage and harm. Drift to pesticides. Um, in this map, I know it's kind of hard to see perhaps, but um, the center block, the center of that circle is, is a small field. And within that one kilometer radius, uh, just above the block to the left, you'll see residential areas. There's homeowners. Uh, there's open water up to the top right, and there's some grapes. That sensitive crop is grapes. You've got greenhouses just to the uh, right and slightly below. At the bottom of that circle, you've got species at risk. And just below and to the left, you've got a golf course. So if you're going in to try and apply a pesticide on that, on that field, when would the right wind direction be? It's almost impossible. So we need to consider those types of things. Uh, there may be a reason why that field was such cheap rent because it was almost impossible to find the right conditions to spray without the risk of causing harm to someone else. Another thing I'd like to talk about is cleaning application equipment. Um, we'll talk about how to do it in just a moment, but uh, in this example, these are soybeans that uh, have been damaged by dicamba. They're non-genetically modified uh, soybeans, so they're not tolerant to dicamba. And what they did is just, just to show an example of, of how much uh, pesticide can be left in a sprayer. So they sprayed a dicamba, uh, corn with dicamba, and then they came in and did the first rinse with that sprayer and sprayed it on, on these beans. And you can see they're pretty much dead on that top left with the full rate of the rinse. Um, the f sorry, with the full rate of the pesticide. On the first rinse on the top right, you'll see that there is some damage. The beans are stunted. Uh, after the second rinse, you in the bottom left, you'll see that the, the beans do look healthier. But in comparison, on the bottom right after the third rinse, those beans are growing much better than the uh, after the first or second rinse. So even though it's very time consuming and it's a lot of work and uh, Murphy's Law would state it's a beautiful spraying day when you're switching over from one product to another, it certainly pays and is the right thing to do to do that triple rinsing of your sprayer. So how do we go about the process? 
First of all, read the label. Some pesticides will require that you ha need to use an ammonia product to rinse the tank after it's been used. Some products will say soap and water. Some might suggest that you use a non-ionic surfactant to clean the sprayer. So you need to read that label. Um, one product won't fit all pesticides. The second thing we're going to do at the bottom of the screen is we're going to rinse the sprayer inside and out, fill the tank at least 10% and spray the rinseate on the field you just sprayed. So it's important to get that heavy first rinse out of the tank onto a field. We don't want to see people going into the into the uh, corner of the woods or back along the railroad tracks or or anywhere else dumping and rinsing out sprayers. Uh, the third thing is to recirculate the cleaning agent and flush through the line for 10 minutes. And then lastly, we're going to repeat that performance and do recirculate clean water and flush through the lines for 10 minutes. That's a very condensed version. Depending on the sprayer, there's filters and screens. Uh, you might have a wet boom where you need to take off the end caps to, to get rid of that portion of the spray that might be in the sprayer as well. Uh, so all those things, again, it's very specific with the pesticide you're using as well as the type of spray equipment that you're working with. The last thing we're going to touch on is you suspect you have herbicide drift. Now what do we do? So first of all, you go to a field and you see some damage in your field and you're not quite sure what it is. So we need to figure out, is it really spray drift? Uh, are there damage patterns in the field? Is there evidence of an application? Now, whether you had sprayed or a neighbor uh, nearby, you need to figure out what's taken place. The next step is to contact the appropriate people. Talk to your neighbor or the pesticide applicator and get details of what was sprayed, where and when. Call the Spills Action Center and they will contact a pesticide specialist in your region for you. This is important. You need to report as soon as possible. The concentration of herbicide drops quickly in the plant. Do not wait until there are symptoms. Um, the Ministry of Environment officers visit the site, take samples and have them analyzed. They need evidence of off-label use. The next step is to document all details of the problem. Collect your spray records, yours and the offending applicator's records. Collect the weather records. If you don't have them, it's very easy to go on uh, Environment Canada websites and other websites to find the local weather uh, records from the past. Take photos, lots of them. Record the date and time on each photo, which is easy with digital uh, cameras. Uh, take photos through the growing season. So you want to keep record of, of what took place. Determine the yield loss from the damaged crop and compare it to the undamaged crop. This can be very difficult at times um, because of the pattern of the, of the damage in the field. Uh, it's something you need to come to agreement with the person who may have caused the damage and uh, ahead of time so that you can agree on, on figuring out what the loss actually was. Hopefully you don't have to do this, but if you do, here's the proper way to do it. Thank you.